word interferences. What do you understand by that? Interferences, yeah. AAS technique, we say interferences. What, what do you understand by interferences? What are we measuring? Okay, what are we measuring in AAS? What are we measuring? Absorbance of the analyte. Lah. Okay, so, so that will be your, your objective, to measure the absorbance and to relate, relate it to concentration if you want to do a quantitative determination. So when I say interferences to the determination, what would, what would, what would it be? Interferes in what? In the, in the absorption, in the absorbance reading that we take. Maybe it makes it higher or it makes it lower. So anything, any process, something that happens that, that disturbs your absorbance readings to, so that it's not what it should be, is considered an interference. And we had talked about uh, the two categories, or the two categories shown here, Spectral, when you talk about spectral, it must be something to do with the wavelength. And so it could be that uh, you have an absorption of another species that overlaps the absorption of your atomic species is considered interference because you know you just want to measure absorbance of copper, but in your system another species also absorbs at the same wavelength because here AS you all, the monochromator the detector is always looking at a specific wavelength so anything that interferes in your reading of that absorbance at that particular wavelength that you chose is considered an interference that you have to do something to to get rid of it so okay um, chemical interference usually it'll be some kind some something in the system that affects the atomization characteristics of the analyte or rather atomization process of the analyte which will then <coughs> uh, change the absorption characteristic of the analyte okay so we see first we look at spectral interference because this this word spectral comes from spectrum it must be some something happens at that wavelength so the occurrence, uh, uh, example of a spectral interference would be uh, absorbance and an absorbance of another species overlapping with the absorbance of your analyte, of your analyte atom in the in the flame or in the graphite, or emission. Okay, but they say that because the atomic lines are so narrow, the the probability of uh, this kind of interference is very rare um, because then the lines would be to the line the interfering line would would have to be very close to your analyte line so this because it's line spectrum the possibility of overlap is less if it's a band spectrum if you talk about molecular species probability of overlap is greater you know because it's broader compared to if it's you know, narrow lines compared to something broader. Overlap between uh, adjacent adjacent wavelengths is higher in this case of uh, if the for band spectrum compared to line spectrum. So that was uh, okay. The next category, which still falls under um, spectral interference, is uh, known as background interference. Okay, remember I said something about if you put in seawater, your sample contains high dissolved salts. It's clear, maybe the solution may be clear, but actually the amount of dissolved salts NaCl, lead chloride, what have you, anything, potassium nitrate, whatever, you know, it, the amount of dissolved salts 
you don't really the salt you don't really see anything in the solution but you know it's a saturated solution high dissolved salts so when it goes into your flame and the solvent has evaporated and whatnot because you have so much salts the possibility of some of the salts not uh, becoming a gas it's still in a particular uh, particular form and therefore it can interact with your light from your source it doesn't absorb the light but it scatters so if you don't understand scattering please go and read it up you know google up what what is the scattering process it's it's also some form of absorption it absorbs it a while and when it releases the light it releases it in different directions so it scatters it in different directions so when that happens when scattering happens the light does not reach the oops. so scattering happens the beam is scattered does not reach the monochromator, does not reach the detector. So to the to the detector, it just it just recognizes it as decrease in PO and it reads it as absorbance. It doesn't know that's it doesn't know what's happening in the flame. All it knows is PO has been reduced, A will increase. Okay. It will um, it will take it as absorbance. So this is something that you have to overcome. Um, or it could be a broadband absorption, and the classic example that you know that we've shown, CaOH overlap with the barium line. So that is molecular band spec absorption band overlapping with your barium line which is occurring in your flame or your graphite whatever so here direct overlap okay so these two problems uh, results in reduction of the the PO okay and so you are now uh, Taking, uh, getting absorbance readings which are not due to your analyte. So you must get rid of this kind of interference and the ways in how, how this is done are called background correction procedures. So when you talk about background correction is to overcome this kind of problems. This problems is also termed as background interference or background absorption something else other than your analyte which is absorbing okay in the background be it it could be the scattering it could be molecular absorption several ways of how to overcome this problem of background interference or background uh, absorption and as we have mentioned before the double beam does not overcome this problem you know the double beam configuration where you have part of the beam going through the flame part of the beam outside as a reference beam that that configuration of the AAS instrument does not overcome this problem because the reference beam doesn't go through the flame okay one the first method of background correction we are going to look at three three types of background correction how you do background correction how you overcome that background interference the cheapest way we usually get this when we buy the equipment we usually get this particular uh, background correction uh, method which is a continuum source correction basically what you have is everything is the same you have your hollow cathode lamp your flame or whatever your electrothermal at atomizer but apart, uh, besides that we also have a deuterium lamp deuterium lamp is what kind of a source is it a line source it's the same category as your tungsten lamp tungsten lamp are what continuous sources giving out radiation over a large range of wavelengths okay but deuterium usually is in the uv uh, you 
gives out UV uh, radiation because the sometimes the uh, molecular absorption bands are in the UV region. So what we have is your deuterium lamp, which is now going to also go through your atoms, whether it's the flame or your graphite furnace. So you now have two beams. One is your normal hollow cathode lamp, your, uh, uh, your copper lamp, your lead lamp, whatever. And apart from that, you have your deuterium lamp and you must one thing about this particular correction, background correction method is you must make sure that uh, the deuterium lamp is aligned such that it goes through the same path as your hollow cathode beam. Okay. You don't want it coming out, out or going through a different section of the flame. It must, that's what you call alignment, alignment of the hollow cathode lamp with your deuterium lamp. Okay. So what it hopes to do is when the lamp is on, um, the, if you have molecular absorption, it will absorb the um, light from the source, from the deuterium lamp, um, as well as it also gives you an estimate of the absorption due to scattering okay you you want by using this lamp we want to estimate that background absorbance is how much because we said just now due to the fact that this happens the absorbance that you are reading is absorbance of analyte plus because of this interference your absorbance that you read is actually analyte plus some background scattering or molecular absorption okay this is what you read so by using the deuterium lamp we try to estimate how much this is and then when you estimate how much this is you can minus subtract from this total in order to get what you want okay so this is the aim of this background the three methods that we are going to discuss about uh, background correction is to how to subtract that background so that you only get your absorbance due to and the light. So what happens with this deuterium lamp is when um, when the deuterium lamp is on we take it that the absorbance is due to background. So it will take so here you have a rotating chopper. Whenever you have a chopper, it means that you are letting two beams uh, have its turn through your atoms. So at, in, at, at one position of the chopper, it will the, be the light from the hollow cathode lamp going through your atoms. At another position of the chopper, it will be only the radiation from the deuterium lamp that goes through your atoms. So when it's the hollow cathode lamp, absorbance is A analyte plus A background. When is the turn of your deuterium lamp, the absorbance is here. Because analyte is narrow, absorption is narrow, background broad. So that's why when you have your deuterium lamp on, deuterium lamp gives a whole range of wavelengths it is used to estimate the background because the, the atomic absorption is so little so it assumes that when this thing is on the absorption reading that you get absorbance reading is due to background so you minus that and that's what is shown here uh, analyte absorption plus background absorption and you minus so this is when the hollow cathode lamp is on this is the reading that you get this is when the deuterium lamp is on. So uh, in the circuitry, there's a way that you can then subtract that. So this is one form of background correction, the cheapest. And the only catch here is alignment of the two lamps, such that the path is through the same uh, position in the flame or the furnace. 
second method of background correction is called the Smith-Hippia correction, source self reversal. You might them. Uh, it's not Perkin Elmer. There's another supplier that it is based on the same idea, but they call it different differently. You know, ultra pulse or something. But the idea is the same. Now here is what is being done for this particular method. No, they don't use any continuum lamp. What you do is you run the hollow cathode lamp at a higher current. So at first you run it at a low current, your recommended current, you take the reading. Then you run the lamp at a higher current and you take another reading. And by subtracting between the two, you will get your A and a light. The purpose is still the same. The purpose of this method is also to get to estimate this and to, to finally just get A and a light. So what happens now we want to understand how what happens at that low current and high current. What we're looking here is the light given out by the lamp. Okay? This is not absorption, this is just light coming out from the hollow cathode lamp. At and we're looking at a particular wavelength, let's say uh, the wavelength of copper, three to four nanometers here. Because we want to uh, measure the absorbance of copper. So at your recommended cu current, we say that you know, even though it's a line spectrum, remember, it's got a certain width. Okay? This, is, this, is not, this is not even going through the monochromator, this is just light from the lamp. Okay? It has a certain width. Um, when you run it at higher currents, what happens is you get self-absorption. Um, where, you know, when you, when you run it, when you run the lamp at a higher current, more atoms are being formed. So the possibility of the ground state atoms absorbing light which comes out from its excited neighbor. This is all happening in the lamp. So the lamp, you, in order to get this light from a copper lamp, you must get copper atoms being sputtered out from the cathode and getting excited. When it drops down to ground state, then it, re re it releases the light and you see light coming out from the lamp. That's how it works. Okay? But when you run it at a higher current, you get a lot of atoms being formed and not all of them are excited. I think you just did some calculation to find out the uh, ratio of uh, excited atoms to ground state, right? Dependent on temperature. So not, it's not, when you have it at a certain temperature, you don't think that, oh, 100% is going to jump up. No, it's only a certain percentage will, which will be excited to the higher energy level at any, at any wavelength that, you know, at any wavelength. So at the higher current now, you have more ground state and when its friend, excited friend, emits the light, it can absorb. So, you know, that's why we call it, it can be termed as self-absorption. Another copper ground state atom is absorbing the uh, radiation given out by another copper excited atom in the lamp itself. We're not even talking about the flame yet. It's all in the lamp. So, the light that comes out from the lamp is the uh, intensity is lower in at the absorption so if this is 3 to 4 the absorption occurs more here okay why is it broader higher current higher temperature so you get your pressure broadening or your what your pressure broadening i suppose higher temperature so that's why at the higher current this blue thing we get it's broader right the emission line is broader compared to lower current so, and we get also this phenomenon of self-absorption where the light is absorbed more in the, uh, you know, in the, at, the wave, at the nominal wavelength, at the analyte wavelength, at the copper wavelength. So what we get is like a valley at the chosen wavelength. So now this is what goes through your uh, flame or knee. So when at low current, what we estimate is absorption of analyte and background. Okay. 
at low current you estimate this this is what you get the absorbance the detector reading will be a analyte plus a background at low current at high current you estimate background so you just minus the two this is what you do here so absorbance at the high current estimates background absorbance so what you do is now uh, absorbance uh, at low current minus absorbance at high current will give you A of the analyte does everybody follow this does everybody follow this background method background correction method so just now one was using the lamp this one no deuterium lamp just playing around with the current running at low current and high current but of course this method uh, will shorten the lifetime of the lamp because you're supposed to run it at the recommended current but of course there are now like I said uh, instruments that you know are based on this kind of background correction and they you know they, they don't say it's a problem like, with the with the lifetime of the hollow cathode lamp and like I said they name it differently they don't call it Smith Hefe or they call it probably ultra pulse it's a good thing that if you can just Google up you know AAS instruments and you can see uh, the websites of the suppliers where they show you all these different different equipment with different uh, accessories how they say they do background correction okay the third one is the most expensive which of course we don't have Zeeman effect background correction why is it more expensive it needs a magnet so essentially here is what is shown here and it's usually used for graphite not for flame but I'm sure uh, with uh, what is that is it Taiwanese brand or the Shimatsu I think they have an AS instrument I, I believe you know somewhere in the back of my mind that you know they did Zeeman for flame but it's not a it's not a common thing okay so you have your graphite furnace that's where your atoms will be formed. You still have your source, your monochromator, and whatever. The, the difference is now the, where the atoms are formed, the atomizer is now in a magnetic field. Where what we see is, with the magnetic field, the absorption profile is changed. This blue thing shows the absorption profile of the atoms in a magnetic field. Because when you put the magnetic field, the levels, the energy levels change. So instead of having one peak, one absorption peak, you have two pi peaks and one central, uh, sorry, one pi and two sigma peaks. You can go look it up. You should have done it in your inorganic or physical. Zeeman effect. What it does to the energy levels, why you get these three, peak, these three peaks instead of one. And with the use of a polarizer, we then can, again, the whole purpose of this is to estimate the background absorbance. Um, okay, to try to understand what is being done here, atoms in a strong magnetic field will, will experience splitting of the electronic energy levels. And so that's why you get what is shown on top here is uh, the absorption. Okay, the shaded one just to show opposite the bottom is the bottom peak is light from the source the top just to show that is absorption you show the peak in an opposite direction okay like a valley so this this shaded thing is absorption due to your atoms absorption profile of the atoms so when there's no magnet it's no no magnetic field the magnetic field is off so the absorption profile is just one peak okay so this will estimate um, which one the total a analyte plus a background when the magnetic field is on we find that uh, and you use the plane polar polarizer you, know, you polarize the light that means the sigma will be in one polarization, will absorb in one polarized light and the, the pi peak, the center peak, will absorb another polarized light in another plane. 
so they they don't the absorption is not is uh, dependent on the polarization of light so that's why I say these terms you must try to understand uh, that's what we went to you know reflection all these terms all these terms about optics or we came from physics that you have to understand because it's used in the instruments okay so that's why we show here only the where you absorption is only the, the sigma the two humps at the, the side you don't get the absorption in the middle so when the magnetic field is on what do we estimate background and from the two minus subtracting this from this this minus this will give you a and a light same thing except that because you now use this magnetic field in the instrument it, it becomes a more expensive equipment okay so those are uh, examples of how you overcome background absorbance and they are called background correction okay and what we said what, what was it due to uh, scattering of the light in the atomizer or uh, some molecular absorption by some other species that you want to overcome that you have to subtract from your uh, absorbance readings that you get so that is the category of spectral interference now we talk about chemical interference so as the name goes chemical interference it must be something to do with the the chemistry of the analyte species so this kind of interference is result when uh, something affects the atomization so one first category is you form compounds which are less volatile what is the classic example i have mentioned this again and you, you know if you're asked to be given a, to give an example i mean this is should be a classic example that you should always remember and i'm sure you are going to do it in lab where and a light of interest calcium in your sample lots of phosphate so now in the flame what happens is you form a complex between your calcium and your phosphate which are less volatile compared to you know if there's no phosphate so because of the lower volatility due to the presence of phosphate you get less calcium atoms being formed and naturally your absorbance is lower than what it should be when there was no phosphate so in this case the phosphate interference reduces your absorbance you know lowers your absorbance how do you overcome that okay because if it's in your sample how are you going to get rid of that phosphate so such kind such kind of interferences where you form low volatility compounds compounds of low volatility there's two ways of overcoming that one is by using a releasing agent something that you have to add you have to add something to your sample and your standards remember whatever you add to your sample you must add to your standard even though in your standard there's no problem about the phosphate okay your phosphate was in your sample but whatever additional reagent you add you must add to your standards as well so from the name releasing agent an example of releasing agent is lanthanum so to your standard you add some lanthanum nitrate and to your standard solutions also okay now what we hope for this lanthanum to do is to release the calcium from the interference so from the name releases as a releasing agent lanthanum will now complex the phosphate and sort of releases the calcium frees the calcium because the problem just now was the calcium complex by the phosphate so now when you add the lanthanum lanthanum will uh, there will be more uh, preferential complexation between lanthanum and phosphate so that's why it's called a releasing agent releasing the calcium the analyte of interest okay that's how it works but of course with any reagent that you have to add you must make sure that it's it's uh, pure okay you don't want to add lanthanum salts that also contain some calcium remember any acid that you use buffer solution reducing agent you must make sure you're not adding analyte to your 
I mean, it's not contaminated with, with some of your metal. The other kind of re, uh, reagent to add is called a protective agent. Why is it called differently? Because it acts in a different way. An example will be EDTA. Everybody know ED Does everybody know EDTA? What does it stand for, Benjamin? Ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. What do you use it for in one for one? Where, 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 where does EDTA come from? What do we use it for? In what kind of titration? Complex symmetric titration to determine metals. Metals, you know, you don't think. Oh, anytime now that you've learned AAS, anytime you want to do analysis of metals, AAS, nothing else. Whereas you can do determine it if it's higher concentration. You can titrate it, do a complex symmetric titration where your, your reagent, your complexing agent is EDTA. Remember EDTA with the six ligands, the six arms that can complex your metal ion? Okay, this is what. So we use it as a protective agent for the same purpose. EDTA will then, it, EDTA forms very strong complexes with most metals. So when you add it to your solution, it will complex your, EDT, uh, your calcium and sort of, you know, doesn't give the chance for the phosphate to complex the calcium. But a good thing about the calcium EDTA complex is volatile, okay? Even, so you, you are protecting your calcium. That's why the name comes, that's why the name uh, is the coin as protective agent. So it works differently. Protective agents and releasing agent, but all for the purpose of overcoming this problem. The next thing under chemical interference is uh, something to do with the dissociation equilibria of the oxides of the metal. You know, it may be, it may form like like we were talking that day. You know, silver and chromium. Silver doesn't easily form oxides, but the chromium is more easily oxidized. So th these kind of things, which sometimes. That's why you require fuel rich, fuel lean, or whatever, you know, depending on the characteristics of the analyte. It's oxidizing or reducing equilibria. Uh, um, because whatever it, we show here, we want lots of M, right? So you want to reduce this, reduce MO, M, uh, the hydroxide. So you want to, for the equilibrium to be more to the right so that most of this will dissociate. Third interference is, so we've gone to spectral chemical ionization. We mentioned this before also. Some metals ionize more easily than others. You know about ionization potential? I don't know whether you did it in KTT 111, probably you'll do it in to one two inorganic for sure ionization potential kind okay, different from the from the periodic table you can tell you can uh, predict so which one is more easily ionized etc etc okay alkali metals lowest ionization potential so in the flame where you have a lot of this uh, where you have all this heat energy or in the graphite some metals will oxidize more easily than others and when ionization occurs what happens to the number of atoms here how does the phenomenon of ionization, what does it do to the number of atoms produced in the flame or in the graphite? Is the number of atoms increase or decrease due to ionization? Decrease. If M goes to M plus, of course, number of M will be reduced and your absor absorbance will, will be reduced. So, when ionization occurs, it will affect your absorbent. So you want to um, suppress, you call it suppress, suppress a revolution, suppress ionization, okay? By using a ionization suppressor, suppressant. Something that you add to the system, again, something that you add to your sample solution, to your standard solution, so that when it goes into the flame, ionization will be reduced. Before we show how the ionization suppressor works, 
let's look at you know just to show uh, degrees of ionization at different flame temperatures here are the alkali metals and we go into the transition metals okay ionization potential here lower of course here a lot higher so we look at the fraction ionized at 2000 kelvin and compare that to 3500 just for cesium here you get 0 0.01 uh, ionized compared to 0.86 of course higher temperatures you see greater ionization so the problem is with the alkali metals but even for the other metals it depends if you use uh, nitrous oxide you know at a higher temperature even the strontium at the lower temperature air acetylene maybe it's only 0 0.0001 but when you go to your higher nitrous oxide acetylene which you require for strontium a higher temperature flame the degree of ionization is higher so how do you overcome that by adding your ionization suppressor and of course i don't have i don't i didn't show it here and how does it work i think you have explained explain in the knee right in the assignment which i'm supposed to finish grading or the one that i gave back to you for example you are doing your analysis of sodium so sodium due to ionization it will low ionization potential you get ionization of sodium so one way is to add uh, an ionization suppressant lithium for example or and let's say cesium lah, cesium chloride it's also an alkali metal and you add it at a high concentration maybe 3000 ppm okay to your standards to your sample so now in your system you also have cesium you have a lot of cesium so these things all will go into flame cesium will also ionize produce lots of electrons and it will now shift the equilibrium for the sodium because this is you got you have a lot of this and not so much of this okay because you've added in excess a lot of your ionization suppressor and so it will cause an uh Shatter's principle at work in the flame okay so that you then shift this equilibrium here you suppress ionization of sodium that's why it's called an ionization suppressor cesium salts or potassium that's what we normally use I think lithium is more expensive or cesium is expensive too but you know this is what is usually done or rubidium for that matter now I give you a plot this plot tells you absorbance versus concentration and we are looking at strontium we're looking at the calibration curves for the bottom here is using air acetylene the one above is using nitrous oxide tell me what you what information you can get from this graph I'm gonna keep more interesting here uh, is this another limb both of you are limb no no okay. yes please Number one, what do you learn from this? What do you learn from these plots given? Air acetylene, nitrous oxide acetylene, which is a higher temperature flame? Nitrous oxide acetylene or air acetylene? Which one is of high, uh, a higher temperature? It's not given here. It's not given here, but from your knowledge of what we've done, which one is it? Do you remember? Nitrous oxide acetylene is hotter. Uh, burner slot, how long? 5. Air acetylene, 10. So now you know, this, this graphs, this plots up here at a higher temperature compared to this one. Number 2, what else can you tell me? 2 up here. let's take uh, the same you know in order to compare you must take only one thing that's different and the rest should be the same okay so let's take the plot where we have added and what is shown here is that calc potassium is also added so all these dots are standard solutions of strontium but with 
different amounts of potassium added and you know so it must be potassium okay 1000 ppm must be an ionization suppressor so we now let's say compare this plot 1000 ppm potassium added to this one this plot and let's take similar concentration this black dot and this black dot what can you tell me this one air acetylene with 1000 ppm this one 1000 ppm added same concentration of strontium but air uh, different flame higher temperature flame what is your conclusion hmm? higher temperature yes what is higher what is higher between these two what is higher just give me one word absorbance so absorbance at nitrous oxide is more than acetylene why even if you look at the zero where's the zero look at the zero zero it didn't give a zero for nitrous oxide okay what why do you think the absorbance is higher for nitrous oxide So in this, for both cases, we have tried to overcome the ionization. We added some uh, potassium. So it's not, it's not, it's not ni uh, ionization. What, what is it? Why is this black dot of lower absorbance compared to this one? Same concentration of strontium, same concentration of ionization suppressor, but only the flame is different. Higher temperature flame. What will happen? What will happen more at a higher temperature? When absorbance is higher, what is it due to? What does it show? Absorbance is related to what? Here. What is absorbance related to? What does it tell you? What? What about, what about, you know, when we measure absorbance, what is it? I measure absorbance of copper. What does it tell me? Okay, this absorbance is higher than that absorbance of two samples. What does it tell you? It tells you, oh, a, epsilon is equal to, A is equal to epsilon BC, you know, is that what you think of? S simp a simple thing, what, what is it? If absorbance is higher, Concentration is higher, but hey, concentration is more. Same concentration, right? Same concentration going into your air acetylene, same concentration into your nitrous oxide, but yet absorbance readings are different. Higher for, air, uh, for nitrous oxide. What does that high temperature do? Nitrous oxide acetylene, higher temperature, 3000 over. Here is about only 2000. Higher temperature means more what? More what? more atoms atomization efficiency higher more atoms form of course more ions form also okay but the catch is absorbance does not measure the number of ions form okay absorbance is only atoms of course your background absorption which you we, which we don't talk about here okay it's not a problem here so now absorbance here is only related to the atoms produced in the flame because it should be the same because it's the same concentration but at that higher temperature you get more atoms form atomization is more efficient dissociation is more complete you know all these all these things so that's why you get a higher reading uh, so we see for all you know even this for all the standards at nitrous oxide acetylene you get higher absorbance readings um, now we look at here we just look at the three top curves 1,000, 10,000, 25,000. Again, we look at the same concentration. Here, here, here. Okay. Here you have 1,000 uh, ionization suppressor at 1,000 ppm. Here 10,000, here 25,000. Why is there an increase of absorbance? Again, any increase of absorbance means more atoms. Nothing to do with ions. It's just that when you have more ionization suppressor, ionization is suppressed naturally you have more atoms more atoms high absorbance so you must know all these things absorbance is related to what you know absorbance is not related to what i'm going to eat for lunch after this just 
atoms emission comes from they must be excited because you can look at you can look at emission also next time higher temperature you expect emission to be higher uh, provided you have overcome if its ionization is a problem because why higher temperature number of excited atoms higher right from that Boltzmann distribution and and excited over NO dependent on temperature E minus KT okay so higher temperature ratio of excited to ground state higher naturally more excited state more atoms in the excited state more will come down and emit more so you must whatever readings you get you know you're not a robot you must have some logical connection to all these things absorbance must be related to atoms emission emission uh, excite, number of excited states so okay i can give you a graph you're supposed to tell me all that another way is to you know another way to ask the question is okay i can ask okay if we how do we uh, the the classic question will be how to overcome ionization and you will tell oh use an ionization suppressor etc etc but i can give you a graph and you tell me the story should be a, around the same story except plus an effect of temperature here it's not a hint but i i like those kind of questions because it makes you think if not it's just you know you just i can just you can just memorize whatever notes the whole text some people are very good at that and so and you ask the same thing i teach you a i say what is a you tell me what is a but i can tell you i can say something else related to a and you are supposed to explain to me what is a i just don't ask you what is a that's the challenge and i think you must be challenged <laughs> then you you get to think okay last one for the day organic solvents who has done the AAS experiment you did a uh, role of organic ethanol do you do that not yet uh, adding ethanol or glycerol no you, you have right, right so when we have there are certain um, how to say this uh? We'll, we'll come to it uh, on Friday lah. but when you put your usually we do aqueous solution you know your solvent is just water now if you add some ethanol some organic solvent and there will be an, on Friday I'll tell you when is it that we might want to use uh, organic solvents in this case when we do extraction you've done extraction in organic lab never mind we'll talk about that later too okay there where you use your solvent is now uh, metal isobutyl ketone which you have to put into your flame okay so when you now have organic solvents what happens is usually the predicted uh, effect is that your absorbance will be higher why with organic solvents you have uh, increased nebulization efficiency nebulization efficiency is just how many droplets you produce okay uh, you know organic solvents ethanol will lower the surface tension therefore you get smaller droplets smaller droplet sizes means more get into the flame because remember the bigger ones go into the drain and more rapid evaporation however when you use this MIBK you have to use less acetylene because the organic salt this MIBK acts as a fuel also and you're introducing the fuel so when you do uh, analysis of this uh, in such a solvent you have to reduce the the fuel the acetylene okay so this is the role of organic solvents or effect of organic solvents which sometimes you try to do it in the lab and you you know it should go higher and yet you didn't but still you put it down as yes it increased for whatever reason okay so that's the last thing for today uh, I, I still haven't found the topics yet. Maybe is it?